last week on the Al Nicoletti Show. Without further ado, let's welcome Ray to the show. Ray, brother. That's awesome. <laughs> Al, you gave me uh, more energy right now. <laughs> Good. The foundation of real estate follows people. The more people are in the area, the real estate generally will go up. And uh, if the real estate value goes up, more people will start to buy them. That's why we only go to states that more people are moving into. Do you have to do mm -hmm. some on-ground research to find out maybe what's going on? We do online on-ground research. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never go to any city to just research the area. If you have a lot of offers going out, it's just like your small armies for you. If you can offer someone half of their value for the land, if they are willing to call you back and still want to sell their land, they're already very motivated. Good point on that. You don't want to talk about the price all the time. You know, if you talk about the price all the time, it's just like you go to the flea market and try to bargain. Bargain is different than negotiation. Negotiation comes from a person. You know, you care about them. This unique thing about us is we don't have a script. How do you script anyone or everybody into one simple script do you think people don't know why you call them they absolutely know they just want you to generate that conversation they want someone to talk to about what's going on not just with the price or the land but other things have you ever had any uh, crazy stories when making negotiations one of the questions i always ask is you know what's the best you can do there's a guy who said one dollar let's do it <laughs> so i got the yeah. land for one dollar first of all figure out what you're buying you know, you don't want to buy without the knowledge. One thing to remember is you are not the market. What you don't like might be someone's favorite. Love it. We're going to leave it right there. Uh, Ray, again, so happy we got to do this. Thank you so much, Al and your team. If you missed any of last week's episode with Ray John, talking about the seven steps to land flipping simplified, you don't want to miss that. You can check out that out. It was a great episode. It made me feel inspired to get into land flipping. It just, and he broke it down in such a way that just made a lot of sense. That was a great episode. And if you want to see more of the guests on the Alan Paletti Show, you can scan the link tree. We'll put that up in just a second. But if you scan that, you'll get all the content on the Alan Paletti Show, all the seasons. And if you check out all the socials on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you'll get all the content on probates, quiet titles, all the weird stuff in the title world. And uh, we're going to, we're going to let it rip. So, all right, everybody. I gotta tell you something. I see how many people are watching right now, and this is fantastic. You are all in for a special treat on this episode. I'm excited. I got goosebumps right now because I get to really dive deep tonight with Stephanie Shepard, and we're gonna talk about finding people, missing heirs, a whole bunch of things we'll get into, and I'll do that on the intro. But you wanna stay tuned. I got my notepad out, I got my pen, we'll, we'll get there. But just got to say for opening thoughts for the night. You know, one thing that has been really working in my business has been building a system and making it systemized, right? When you start growing a business and scaling it, you have to have things in place to make it very efficient. And the one thing that has really worked for me in my business is the probate checklist. Anybody that's done a probate with me knows that when we get that probate, we send you the checklist because... It just makes things efficient. It qualifies sellers. It tells everybody, this is what we need. And to be able to figure it out, we need these items. And I know that works for me. And I know Stephanie's going to talk about her checklist. But I saw that and I'm thinking, it's so true. When you have these things in place, it makes it work. And ever since that was implemented, about four months ago, things have been way more streamlined. So if you're running a business and you're scaling it, you gotta make your own checklist. That's the point I wanted to make across tonight. So I got my pen, I got my paper. We got a lot of people watching tonight and uh, I'm ready to rock this thing. So let's go. Hey everybody, my name is Al Nicoletti. I'm an attorney from Florida and welcome to the Al Nicoletti Show where I bring on real estate super investors, rising rock stars, movers and shakers, and leaders of clubs in their communities that educate, entertain, and inspire all things on Florida real estate and always, Bring in the best experts in our industry. Whether we're talking about Airbnb, commercial, marketing, branding, entrepreneur, you name it. We always want to bring the best value to you on how you can level up your game and bring on people that can help you find other people, find heirs on how you can take your company to the next level. On my show, I have Stephanie Shepard. 
and she is going to rock this thing tonight. I gotta do this little intro for her before we bring her on. This is a special one. Stephanie, I can't think of one person in my probate world that I know that I would go to to find heirs. And one of Stephanie's ultimate specialties is that she can find people. And think about it, people. How many times do you come across a deal and you got four people that are out there? Did we lose audio? Where'd audio go? I'm not on audio. Am I? Oh, there we go. That's weird. Mike just went through there. How many people, we keep rolling, how many people have been through that kind of situation before? And Stephanie is going to totally break that down. Because this is what we talk about on the show. We bring this type of caliber gas, and this is what's going to be great. So without further ado, let's welcome her to the show. Steph, Stephanie, what's Hi. going on? What's up, Al? How are you? Good. I thought I lost the whole audio thing. <laughs> oh, thank God. All right. Hey, we're here. I get to meet you and talk to you about this for the first time. And I got to say, this is fantastic. Um, for those that don't know you, just a little bit, like, how did you get into finding skin tracing and all that stuff with people? Yeah, so um, I got into, like, real estate about almost 10 years ago, and um, I had a mentor, and her name was Mary Jo, and she's very dear to me even to this day. And she really opened my eyes to, you know, starting with public records, starting there. And then, you know, gaining access to specific tools in terms of skip tracing, things like that. And she really kind of opened my eyes at, as to what's available to me to be able to look for people. Because I already had like a, a knack for investigations, things like that with my background as an adjuster. And so I just kind of like combined the two and it really gave me something that I had passion for. And so, especially over the last few years, um, and we'll talk more about REI SIFT, but like combining that with REI SIFT was extremely powerful because it really helped me hone in on those people that I really like looking at, like digging into. And then just in, within, within the community, like people needing help, and my name kind of got out there and it really just exploded in a great way. So um, she was definitely instrumental in like pushing me forward to finding out what I love to do. I love that. That's that's fantastic. I just want to make sure everybody can drop a comment if you're watching on Facebook. I want to make sure that people can hear us because I know that happens once in a while with streams and internet, you name it. I want to make sure we get the best value from Stephanie tonight. So I see Joe. I see Teresa. I love it. I love the super fans that come on the show. We always want to provide that value to you all that out there. Um, and so before we... Okay, so people can hear. We got it. We got it. People are joining in. Uh, okay, so what I what I want to do, what I really want to do is I want to dive in on the free resources that people can go to. Because Steph has a lot of case studies that we can dive in on. We'll mm -hmm. talk about some of the paid resources. But I want to give the freebies away before we get to the advanced level stuff. So let's talk about from the basic point, Google. Run with us on Google. Why has Google searching been great for finding people? Well, I think for me, like, you know, Google is such a vast resource in general that, you know, when you, especially in real estate, if you're going to, depending on the county that you're working, you know, if there's a code enforcement hearing or something that pings Al Nicoletti to it, you know, and I'm searching your name, it's not a very common name, right? So, you know, it might come up as a PDF or might link you to that specific hearing. And so then, you can just kind of go down those rabbit holes. And I feel like Google is a great resource. People kind of look past it, but it's great to start there and to, to see kind of what pings back. So I love cool. to start there. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, that, of course, like that's going to be the best starting point for things, right? Uh, and then, and then talk about public records. So I understand public records when it comes to, uh, just finding either probates or pre foreclosures, lives pendants. But in terms of trying to find people, public records can be one of the most resourceful uh, yeah. tools out there. Why? So if you think about public records, it should be public, right? Like 
Florida, for example, in my opinion, is one of the best states to access public records because a lot of it is readily available to you online and you can just, you know, search and find and all that. Certain states and counties don't make it as easily accessible, but it's there. Um, so you might have to just request it. So we all have the ability to submit like a Freedom of Information Act request and with, you know, requesting something intent with intention. But like in Florida, you can search, you know, let's just say I own properties over the course of 30 years. You can search all the deed transactions. If if my mother went, if I went through a probate with my mother's estate and I was an heir, like you can just find so many cool things, affidavits. I mean, there's just so many things that you can find just by doing a general search in your county's public record system. Yeah, so when you say public record system, um, let's just do an example. So you're in Florida. I don't know what your favorite county is in Florida. But are you going into like the clerk of the court part? Are you going into a claim? Because like in Duval, they have like the official record part, right. and you can you can do a drop down. Like, what are some of the what are some of the best indicator words that you're looking for when trying to find people? Because you're not looking for a, a probate per se or right. a What is like a document that could be a useful tool? I mean, I think that um, so like when I'm a lot of the times when I'm looking up something like in Florida, for example, it's for like a client. So I don't know that specific county personally, like it might be, I don't know, Lee County. And I'll, I'll literally go to Google, Lee County recorded doc search. Like I just kind of dumb it down and Google will take me to the right spot. But a lot of the times what I'm figuring out is the deeds are almost the most important thing to look at because, you know, if I'm on title as a single woman or maybe a married woman, um, so like any indication of my marital status is important when I'm looking at something, um, whoever's on title with me, what they're on title as, you know, joint tenants, you know, husband and wife, mother and daughter. I mean, um, I pay attention to those little details. So I would say like the deeds are very important to look at, especially when you're building family trees out. It's really important to look at those things and to even see, like if you see quick claims, those are indications like, OK, they're probably related, like, you know, usually quick claims kind of go back and forth between family members, things like that. So I pay attention to how the deeds are transferred to. Yeah, great point you brought up with deeds. <laughs> um, the one thing I'm thinking right now is how many people out there that are watching come across properties that are titled in a trust mm -hmm. and then they're now they're trying to find maybe who the trustee is or who the current trustee is and where's the trust. Uh, Steph, do you want to break down like how important that deed could be to finding the next step to maybe where yeah. the person is? Yeah. So like, especially with trust, like, um, cause I deal with a lot of trust, obviously every state has trust. So, um, when I'm looking at a transaction history, like in California, for example, and I see that the owner is a trust, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go back to the previous transaction because it's going to say John and Jane Smith transferring it to John and Jane Smith trust. Right. So I know that they are, you know, maybe they're the, the trustees for now, but in terms of the, the successors are probably going to be kids or something. And I can usually, it's like, you have to, one of my points is going backwards to go forwards, mm -hmm. like kind of have to go backwards in time to go forward in time. And it's like that with family trees. Like you need to figure out who the parents are to figure out who the kids are. Like, you know, I, I look at those things and sometimes you can even find um, other recorded documents from like mother and son or whatever. And then you can kind of put the pieces together. Like, okay, this, you know, John Smith, it's probably Jack Smith's son or whatever. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So let, let's break that down. So that, that concept comes to uh, light. So when you're trying to find people that are in the public records, or you're just trying to find who these people are on title or maybe heirs, the concept of going forward and backwards is really toggling between different types of documents, maybe cross referencing, yeah. trying to see, trying to relate like who this person is with this person. Are, are you, are you doing a lot more cross-referencing with things that are already filed in court? Are you cross-referencing maybe death certificate info? What is that concept? Yeah. So obviously like in terms of free resources, it's definitely like I'm taking a look at anything, especially if it's a, not a common name, I'm looking at everybody. Like I'll, I might just search the last name in terms of like a search because it's like really specific. Um, if it's more of a common name, which happens a lot, um, you really have to be specific in those searches because there's going to be a lot of John Smiths, you know, you have to do like you find a middle initial somewhere, something to just, dis, you know, um, distinguish that specific person that you're looking for, because there could be hundreds of them. Um, but I think that like, 
If you were paying for services, um, Ancestry is a really good one to kind of cross-reference addresses. Also, like on the deeds, especially older deeds, there's always a mailing address, like stamp or return or handwritten old mailing address. Cross-referencing those old mailing addresses is really important to really hyper-focus on that specific person if it's a common name, as for example, because again, there's hundreds of John Smiths, right? So, or um, Jose Garcia's or whatever. So it's really important to literally, I analyze the deed like so carefully to see previous mailing address, you know, how they're named on title, all those things. Um, but Ancestry is a really great one if you're willing to pay for it, if you're finding that you know, you're, you're coming across these types of deals a lot where you're not really, you're kind of stuck. Um, they're great because you can look at census records, especially if they're older, like the older clientele. They're great because the last known public um, census is the 1950 census. And it just came out like last year. And it was like a big deal for me because, you know, the census records are sealed for 72 years to protect us, to protect our really? information. Yeah. So like, you know, 20, 2020 census won't be available until 2092 to protect our information now. It's crazy, right? Wow. So, you know, if you're, if you have older sellers, you know, in their seventies, eighties, nineties, they're usually going to be on a census record, even as a child, they'll be on there. And then you can build the, you can start the family tree from there and kind of, you know, build it out. So it's really cool. So that's how you've been able to dive deep on some of these ones that go that far, like 60s, 70s, yeah. like, I mean, deep, I mean, deep. Yeah. I mean, I remember there was one probate, like the guy died in 1950 mm -hmm. and yeah. nobody could find out where everybody was except just what the fan, like one distant yeah. relative was telling us. It's hard when you're dealing with multiple generations. Cause you know, last names change, especially with the females and stuff. And um, you're kind of going off tangents and you have to kind of find that common ground. And it's tough. Like I worked on a, a colleague of mine, um, family tree, and it was like, second cousin i don't even know the terminology like second cousin once removed or whatever it was and it was just like we we're way out there but those were the heirs like we had to go back to 1800s to build out the tree and it was really intense yeah. that is so crazy we'll get into some of the things with the trees because that's uh building family trees especially in probate situations or heirs that's a little golden nugget right there too um steph let's talk about uh, I don't know if you want to get into the Facebook reverse hack because that'll get into like the story that you had. Um, yeah. But l let's talk about like even the other paid resource like Bin Verified. You know, yeah. I, I remember seeing Bin Verified back in 2018 when I had ju just jumped into probate thinking, okay, if you got to find people, here are some paid resources. And then I remember some people said like, oh, Bin Verified, some of the numbers are old. But here's Stephanie Shepard saying <laughs> it's relevant stuff. So yeah. what's that about? Well, it's great because, you know, there's tons of skip tracing services out there. There's white pages and yellow pages online now. And now like been verified. I mean, there's just so many true people search. And um, I and a, and a couple of my mentors and like a lot of colleagues have really come to like been verified because it not only it might give you some data phone numbers, but it's going to give you a bigger picture on that person. Like, you know, if they are deceased, it might give you more information as to when they passed away or their children and things like that. It gives you kind of a bigger picture instead of just saying, oh, you know, this is the one person that you're looking for. And they they passed away in 1992 and that's it, you know. So right. it's it's really helpful to kind of jumpstart your research, I feel like um, for the price. I think it's really well priced, well worth it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was another one that I saw? I don't know if you actually mentioned it, like uh, not people finder. There's another one that's out there too. That I mean, white pages. Do you like white yeah. pages? I don't know. I haven't really dabbled too much in on it, to be honest. I kind of like find a good one and I just stay there because I mean, everybody and I feel like, you know, their mom is creating a new skip tracing software or something to you know, it, it's a, obviously it's a moneymaker. Like, you know, they white label it and then, you know, whatever, but it's like all the same data I feel like, but, but at the same time, like I'm looking for that, that unicorn that will give me more for what I'm paying for. And I will always recommend it because I'm using it. You know what I mean? Yeah. When Stephanie skip coming out. <laughs> never. <laughs> never. You never say never. You never know. Um, you'll be, you'll, you'll yeah. have your own little CRM. Uh, everybody will be using that. Oh man. Uh, but yeah, like, you know, you were talking about on, uh, on, uh, when we were on the onboarding, which is like skip tracing software, um, that can like reverse address or do like reverse mm -hmm. phone numbers too. I've seen that as well. Yeah. 
like yeah. the use in that. That's that's so useful to try to find people because you may have yeah you may have somebody's number exactly. But you don't know any other details on it. Yeah, and especially for like estranged families, when someone's like, you know, I haven't talked to them in fifteen years, and I'm always like okay, well, like, what's their last known address you have for them if you have an address book or like, you know, what's an old phone number you have for them or something because you can get a hit on those things. Like, it can take you back in time, you know what I mean? It's, it's like the saying, going backwards to go forwards again. Like, mm -hmm. those, all those details matter. And so, I mean, a lot of the time in those situations and I come across them often, they're like, oh, the last time I knew about them, they're in New Orleans. And so I'm like, well, hey, that matters. It's not like I'm looking for the whole state now. I'm looking at New Orleans, you know? So. Gotcha. Yeah. Which brings us to this question because Michael asked this. He goes, how do I find accurate phone numbers for individuals? That would be been verified, right? That would be your go-to? Yeah. yeah, been verified. Um, like I said, Google's great. Like, it, Especially if you don't have a common name because – you know, it might take you somewhere where they filed something in court. Maybe they're a landlord and they had to do an eviction and they had to put their phone number on the eviction docs. Like, I mean, there's just so many things mm -hmm. that there's so many ways that you can find information by just digging. I mean, yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is a question I have actually, and I thought about this in the car, which is, let's just say um, I pulled a list from maybe just public records or I uh, was able to find all the potential probate properties that are out there that haven't been filed yet so you don't okay. know who the bettys are you just know the yeah. person that died and that they owned real estate okay what would be your next step to go and okay i got this data i know who died i know who owned the property but i don't know any of the heirs where's yeah. your go to so my first step is going to like in your case florida going to the county appraiser's office and seeing what their mailing address is so a lot of times when i'm skip tracing somebody you know, people are skip tracing the property address, but if you have an absentee owner or maybe a PO box, you know, mailing, um, sometimes they don't have a lot of association with that address or even their family members, right? But if you're skip tracing that PO box or the mailing address, now you're going to get maybe a child who's somewhat handling the estate, but hasn't, you know, started the estate yet. Um, you're going to start a trail of some type. So I'm always telling everybody, you know, you want to you want to look for the mailing address. If it's different, even better. Like you're going to find someone at that mailing address. So I always tell them that's my first step. I always, I, I always verify ownership. I look at the, the mailing address. I'll look at the deed history too first because you're in there anyway. You're gonna look at the sales transactions. So, yeah. You know, one thing I've known mm -hmm. too, and, and a lot of people don't know this is like death certificates. If you're able to find that death certificate, if you, if you have like the, in Florida, at least even yeah. you have the exact date of death, you have the, uh, uh, the name of the person. And yeah. sometimes the county wants like where they, the, the city where they died. Sure. You know, and death certificates have a lot of useful info, right? Like they have Absolutely. the informant. They have the person yeah. that somebody actually fills yeah. these things yeah. out. It's not yeah. like the county. Um, yeah. Have you ever been able to locate people using death certificates that way and just pulling them from the county? Yeah. So like every state is different. Every, even every county is different nowadays on how they handle death certificates. So like Florida is great because you don't have to be related to to request the death certificate. You have to know like date of death, date of birth, maybe maiden name. I can't remember. But um, like in California, you have to be related. You have to be related or, you know, part of the probate, maybe, you know, some type of um, escrow office or something of stature in order to request it. And so, but what's cool about, you know, my county is I can go down and I can request an informational viewing of a death certificate. So I'm not asking to get a copy. They just flip their computer screen around and they're like, no pictures, but I can, I can write down anything. So I'll write down informant, their, their address. I'll write down the ma the mother's first name, maiden name, where they are from, everything. Cause then I can start on the family tree. Like, cause sometimes the informant isn't a family member. It's, you know, maybe they're in hospice or like maybe it's the doctor or whatever, you know what I mean? It, sometimes they're not related, but you getting the parents information is so critical because again, you're going backwards to go forwards. And if you're stuck, you need that. Like you need that information. That's so true. Yeah. I always think about just the informant, mm -hmm. but now hearing you, I'm thinking, wait, the names of the parents that are also on there are relevant. And maybe if there was a predeceased spouse, that could be relevant too, because you may find nothing for that person that died, but you can find everything else. And that's Stephanie's point mm -hmm. about going backwards and forwards. Didn't think about that one before. I like yeah. it. 
And also to tag along with that, like it's the same case in obituaries. So let's just say that there was a husband and wife that owned a property and the husband predeceased the wife by 10 years. I don't know. Um, and the, the wife, unfortunately, just passed away. She has no obituary, let's just say. So because, you know, it costs money to do that and it's overwhelming, you know, all those things. But, you know, 10 years ago, there was an obituary that laid out the whole family tree for the predeceased husband. So I always tell everybody. You know, I call these sister obituaries, but, you know, they're really just family member obituaries and they're key because, you know, it'll save you so much time in, in, in searching for potential heirs where if you find this other family member that predeceased them and you find their obituary, you have a gold mine right there. Like it tells you their names. It tells you sometimes where they're located, like their spouse's names, all these things. So it's like it's easier. It's easier for you to pinpoint those people. Yeah. Another golden nugget she just brought up is obituaries. Um, not everyone will have an obituary, but somebody's somebody's going and filling that obituary out. Somebody's going out there and naming who the children are, the grandchildren are. I mean, they'll list everything out. I mean, for those yeah. that are advanced that know that for sure, but that is another step to leading you to find somebody. The reason I bring this up that some of this stuff could sound basic to the ones that are seasoned or advanced yeah. is wait until you hear one of the stories uh, Stephanie has on, <laughs> on finding heirs because I was actually on the probate side and could, was mind blown. And so <laughs> just having these little tips really could help you solve a deal that's you, that you think is totally out. You think it's a dead deal. You can't find. Um, I know so many investors I've worked with that are like, where do we go? What do we do? And they know I'm like, Hey, get with Stephanie about this. She'll walk you through what the basics are, but when it dives deeper, you gotta, you gotta get with someone like her. Um, Steph, let's talk about family trees and building the family tree out. So like, okay, you have your data list, you know, the probate list, you do your skip tracing, right? And now it's kind of fitting the pieces in the puzzle together. Um, where do you make a family tree? And how do you, like on a basic level, how do you go about building that out? What does that look like? Yeah. So it's funny as I'm a pen and paper gal, like I've always been. And, um, uncle Carl's on the podcast right now. He's, uncle Carl. Of, um, he's another one of my like amazing mentors. Uh, I consider him a mentor and like a great friend, but, um, so you can actually build family trees in ancestry.com. Like you can create your, you know, you can create your own family tree, but you can create any family tree you want. And what's cool and what I've started to learn with Ancestry is it'll like give you hints. You know, once you start inputting information, it'll give you hints. Whereas I'm literally over here, hand drawn, literally I'm hand drawing with like squares and names and date of births and all that. I'm literally hand writing out all the family trees for everyone that I've ever researched for in the past. I literally have a spiral bound notebook, like with all the family trees in it. So I was doing that all manually by, by me connecting the dots and it probably took a little longer, but like. I want to just, you know, this isn't my case particularly, but I treat it as my own and I want to make sure it's solid, especially like, you know, working with like a, a probate attorney or something, you know, like I want to make sure it's solid information. So I'm over here, like really, you know, in ancestry, looking at every record, making sure I, it is who it is and, you know, making sure they're all tied together. Um, but seriously, you only need like a pen and paper. And if you're looking through records, like, just confirming that you're, especially with common names, confirming that you are looking at who you're supposed to be and not going down the rabbit hole of like, is this the right person? Right. You know, kind of thing. Yeah. Anytime somebody presents me a family tree, I'm like, all right, we'll see what's really going on. Let me, yeah. let me break it down. And then I break <laughs> it down and we find out it's like all over the place. Yeah. Uh, family, family trees are helpful though. Like it, it really helps to have an idea of what's going on. And anybody yeah. that I've done a probate with knows that you find out who everybody is, not just one, everybody. What is yeah. the whole puzzle? Anybody yeah. that post deceased, anybody that pre deceased. And, you know, a lot of times with the skip tracing and finding people, you find that you're doing it to find heirs. Yeah. Right? Like not just people that are on title stuff, right? Like right. you're finding heirs a lot of times. Yeah. And, and this is what's so important. Building that tree out is going to help you on your deals. I, I just got to say, Uncle Carl, the <laughs> he's got wild strategies. My favorite one was still the life estate one with the lady that <laughs> needed to stay in the property. But he uh, he does wild <laughs> stuff too with trying to yeah. find people. And he loves taking those deals on. Yeah. Are the messiest deals sometimes the biggest spreads? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's why, you know, honestly, like, 
when I think about the deals that I like to live in, it's definitely the harder, more challenging deals, but I have to, I can do less of them because they are bigger deals. They're funner deals. I really learn a lot more on these deals. I mean, like within the last few years, like JVing on stuff, I have learned so much that like, I mean, would have taken me decades probably to learn. So it's just, it's very re rewarding, you know, not only financially, but you know, mentally for me, I'm very, I love to challenge myself. So it's, it's just, a, it's a ride, you know? Yeah. And, and speaking of some of the messiest deals being the best deals, we got to talk about the Guam deal. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I'll tell you the story from my end and she's going to dive in. I'll never forget this. Uh, it was a wild week for me traveling around speaking and I'm at the Jack's airport. The investor call says, Hey Al, we got this deal. Um, I do my whole analysis. They say there's no airs. And I'm like, <laughs> Okay, hold on. There's always somebody around. So yeah. uh, they did some digging, did some searching. I think I said, go to see Stephanie. Go, you got to find out what's going on. And uh, I remember all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they found this person. Mm -hmm. But I want you to, I want you to dive in on what happened. Yeah. So um, I had actually been working with this investor for a little bit, like you know, just kind of looking at looking up people for them, things like that. And so we had a relationship. And so they came to me as well. And they said, Hey, um, we, we found this potential deal. You know, um, we don't think there's any, we don't think the air that we're looking for is possibly alive, but we're not sure, you know, all that stuff. So then I started looking at the family tree and I said, okay, you know, this, this woman, this owner had one son, we need to look for him. And so I kind of pushed it back to them. And then they said, Hey, I think we found his Facebook page. Um, but, and I'm like, well, has he read your message? And they're like, we messaged him. I said, has he read it? Because, you know, there's one thing of like getting a message request and then seeing it. So they're like, no, he hasn't read it yet. I'm like, okay, well, you know, let me just confirm this is him because he didn't have the same name on Facebook. Right. So I confirm, I'm like, okay, this is for sure him. Like, so, um, I send him a message, right? This is last year, like almost literally exactly a year ago. I send him a message. And I'm impatient personally. So like the next day I look and I, he hadn't read it yet. So I'm like, well, dang, how am I going to get his attention? So I look at his Facebook profile and I'm like, oh, I, hey, I can comment. I can comment on his posts. So I found a post that like had a lot of interaction, recent interaction on it. And I just made a comment and I was just like, hey, you know, um, I know you don't know me. I know this is super random, but I sent you a really important message. If you can just read it, you know, something like that. Like, I'd really appreciate that. And so anyway, he didn't respond to me <laughs> until January. It was like January 1st of this year. Um, but it took me by surprise. And he was like, how can I help you? And, and um, like we started talking. And uh, when I told him why I was reaching out to him, he um, he's had a lot of like trauma, you know, family trauma in the past. And um, he was very guarded and for good reason. Like he's very guarded. And he was like almost interrogating like soft interrogation and he was asking me questions he wanted me he wanted to feel me out and i was answering all of his questions and so basically he's i like passed his test and like we i felt like we really kind of bonded and we created like this common trust between us but um you know he lives in guam so it was like you know the florida investor and then me in california and then him in guam so it's like all these different time zones and we're trying to coordinate and i was like the middleman and he trusted me. So I had to be his point of contact throughout the whole thing. And I became very protective of him, like throughout the process. But like, he was an amazing seller. And like, we're Facebook friends now. And I mean, it's just, I love my sellers, I become like advocates for them. And you know what I mean? So um, he was a very special case. And um, it was just funny, because uh, his his mother, unfortunately, passed away, like almost four years ago. And um I was like, hey, you know, would you grant us access to the house so we can like see what's there and we can send you personal stuff like family stuff. And he's like, yeah, and I want the Corvette and the garage. And I was like, oh, OK, cool. Like, you know, we haven't been in there yet. So we go and we check the garage and there's no Corvette. And I'm like, oh, no, because we knew that someone had access to the house. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, there was a license plate on the the washer. Right. And I was like, uh, and I ran the plate and didn't, it didn't come back with anything. And I was like, Hey, you don't happen to know the plate number, do you? And he's like, Oh yeah, it's cause it was like a special plate. And I ran it. I'm like, Oh, she sold it. She sold it like in 16, 2016. Oh, wow. So that was a bummer. But like, he was just really great and like, just very kind. And, um, he did everything that we asked of him, like, and was very prompt and just, it was a great deal. It was a great deal.
Yeah, and he had no idea about this property, or he knew that it was there, but nobody yeah. reached out. I think that he knew it was there, but um, there was like a, a family member, a family friend, excuse me, that was involved. And I think I think this person initially was trying to somewhat take like the estate or take the property or something, but then kind of like went MIA because I think people were catching on. He went MIA. And so I think that maybe spooked the, the air a little bit, or maybe he just didn't feel like worthy of it. I'm not quite sure, but I mean, um, ultimately we proved that like he was the rightful heir and, um, you know, he was very grateful for that. So he's, he's been disconnected from his family for a while besides his mother. Like they actually talked up until her passing, obviously, but yeah, it was very special. Yeah. I was very impressed when you found that heir and it was like, mm -hmm. all of a sudden randomly we got him. I'm like, <laughs> what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that ended up being a great deal, right? Another, yeah. another story about, you know, Hey, can't find somebody found them de done deal. I think probate was what, two, three weeks. It was like, it was over. quick. <laughs> it was over. Yeah. I mean, done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there you go. Uh, Steph, what was the other mm -hmm. story with the, uh, with the authentication that pinged somebody by text? What was that? What, what which story was that one? Was it the, um, the Facebook. Facebook hack? Yeah. Okay. Facebook hack. Yeah. So, um, a friend of mine, Joshua, he's actually in the RIA SIFT community. He told me about this hack like two years ago. Basically what you do is when you find someone's Facebook and you know, it's the person you're looking for and maybe they're not responding or seeing your messages. Um, and you kind of want to verify maybe an email address or a phone number for them. You open up an incognito window and you, <laughs> you like, you paste their Facebook special URL in there and you say like forgot password because it's thinking you're trying to log in. And then it says, do you want us to send you a text or an email at, and it gives you the last two phone, um, two digits of the phone number. And then like the last, you know, several letters of the email. So this one lady, I confirmed her phone number as like last two is eight, eight. Right. So I got all excited. And, um, cause we thought she went to the Philippines. So I'm like, okay, I, we have sightings that she's here, like this is her number, you know, kind of thing. And so the investor that like brought me in on the deal, he texted her. He still has yet to hear from her, but like literally I was stalking her Facebook page and I literally pinged her location from a picture of her in front of on the border on Facebook. Like, I'm like, okay, she's at this one. This is the one she's at. You know, like I was literally Googling on the border in like this city and there was like <laughs> seven locations and I'm looking at the facade of the front of it. I'm like, that's not the one that's not, okay. This is the one, you know, like that's, it was kind of more fun than anything, but you know. And as you called it locating social medias and being an investigator with intent. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's not like you're obviously like you can really go down the rabbit hole of like social media stalking, you know, to some degree, but it's like, knowing what you're looking for, being particular as to what you're looking for. Like I was on her page for a reason. I wasn't like trying to, I mean, I'm trying to see about her life, but only to really locate her. Right. Um, and I was like watching a, a short that she had and it almost was still enough for me to get a plate number for a car that was in her driveway, but I couldn't, you know what I mean? But it was just like, we're close. Like we got to keep going. We got to just figure out where she's at physically because she doesn't have a good like ping on her skip trace, you know? Yeah, that's another little hack right there for people that can mm -hmm. learn from that. Uh, yeah. Steph, what was the grease example with the family oh. tree? What was that whole story? So one thing that I want to tell people is like, I feel like people get really intimidated when they when they start looking at someone's family tree and maybe it's like in a foreign country or whatever, like they're like, oh, this is too much. I'm just not going to keep diving into this. Meanwhile, they don't know that they're the only one looking at this, right? So um, this particular example was an, um, an heir in Texas. Um, she unfortunately died. And so we're trying to figure out who her heirs might be, but now we're, we're going back up the family tree because she didn't have kids. So we're going like, we're thinking cousins now. Um, so she had a Greek name, last name and that was her origin. Right. So I literally just like found this website. I was just Google again. Like, I'm like, Hey, I know she's from here per ancestry. She's from this area. Like her mother came over on a ship. Right. Like, I mean, I knew that. Um, and I just like found this website and it said there was a contact us like email. So I just said, Hey, like, I know this is super random. Like McLean uses this, um, phrase really well. And it's like, act like you're the lost puppy. Everyone wants to help a lost puppy. Like just say, Hey, you know, I know this is super random. I'm just wondering if you can help me. Cause everyone's natural tendency is like, we want to help each other. Right. Of course. So I'm like, 
I, you know, I, I, I'm looking for this family tree. Like I have this woman's name and her mother's name, but I just really need to try to find anything. And she's like, okay, so what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to call this, you know, specific region and here's our phone number. And, you know, like literally she just broke it down for me in an email. I'm like, oh my, it's just, you won't know unless you ask. So it's just like, don't be afraid to ask. You might feel like you sound like stupid or something, but it's like, you know, keep it simple. Keep the questions simple. People are going to help you to the best of their ability. Um, and you can just like play off of it, you know, like take that and then go running with it kind of thing. So I just want people to know that. Yeah. It's funny. Uh, when I'm even in consults, sometimes they'll ask, you know, why are we going that deep and what, you know, mm -hmm. who are we looking for? And they'll tell you, the, they know the family. Yeah. Everybody knows yeah. where the family is, what happened. Um, yeah. But it's really asking one the right questions, and two, of course, you, you got to ask. You, you know, a, a lot of times the investor will stop at that one person. It's like, yeah. well, wait, there's more to discover, and that's Stephanie's point. Um, yeah. And finding more people, so don't be afraid to ask questions, and don't be afraid to ask dumb questions, right? Yeah, and I mean, like, I just got one recently that the an LLC owns two properties in Memphis, and like one of them actually was just demolished recently because it's been boarded up for years. And um, so again, an investor reaches out to me and is like, hey, can you help me find this, like the managing member of this LLC? And I said, okay, go to the deed and tell me where this LLC was was um, created. And it's, they say Delaware. I'm like, dang it, right? Because Delaware is like the most protected state to form an LLC. And so I'm like, okay. And then, I'm, and then we're, he's like, hey, there's a Malaysia mailing address. And I'm like, okay, like <laughs> haven't done Malaysia yet. Let's figure it out. And so literally, I, again, I plugged the address into Google, right? And it pings like three different locations on the continent of Malaysia. They're on different sides, right? So I'm like, well, I know the, the I know the town, and it's on this side of the island. So there's two spots, and like the the address had resort in it. So I'm like, that's a little strange. So I look, and I'm like, okay, there's a resort right here. I see it, but like there was an apartment number on the address. I'm like, I don't see where there could be an apartment. So literally, I find the resort on Google, and it's like, go to the website. I go to the website. I, I go to the contact us and it says, go to our WhatsApp phone number page, whatever. So I go to my WhatsApp. Hey, and I realize there's like 300 people in this WhatsApp group. Like oh I'm gosh. just like, I'm just shooting something in the dark, literally. So I'm just like, Hey guys, um, sorry if this is the wrong place, but like, I'm looking for this address. Am I in the right spot or do I have this wrong? And then someone private messages me back and they say, Oh, that's for the apartments right in front of the resort. And I'm like, Oh, so then I drop, you know, Google down and I'm like, oh, those are the apartments. And so I was like, hey, you don't happen to live close by, do you? And he's like, yeah, I live somewhat close by. I'm like, do you think you can door knock it for us? I mean, again, it's just like you won't know unless you try it. I'm literally shooting in the dark and I'm getting a response. And now we have a contact to go door knock, you know, someone local there in Malaysia to go door knock. <laughs> what are the chances <laughs> of that? Yeah. So it's just like just poke around, just poke around, have fun with it, poke around and like you'll figure it out. You know what I mean? Yeah, I would love to even see what that pinging map even looks like. That's crazy. You could just drop that in and then you get like an idea of what's going on. And then asking the right question, seeing if somebody can actually go door knock. So you, you door knock mm -hmm. and they found him, right? Well, so the investor that like hired me to help him, he's drafting a letter for the guy, the door knocker to take with him to go door knock. And then he's going to door knock the neighbors, like if he doesn't reach the person, but he'll leave the letter, you know, in that case. So like, so it's not like a wasted trip, you know? Right. Not a sticky note, <laughs> not a super sticky. Yeah, something. I'm like, you know, it, it's just like, okay, we're going to get this opportunity to find this person. Like, that's amazing. You know what I mean? So. Of course. I mean, <laughs> what are the chance, who's who's out there finding this person? I bet they've never gotten a letter ever from exactly. anybody. I, you know, I own it. I could have this piece of property. I could be an heir. I mean, some of these people yeah. have no idea. That's what a lot of people don't realize, Stephanie, is that there are just so many properties that just sit there. I know. And a lot of heirs have no idea a family member owned it. Absolutely. And that's like, honestly, a lot of the conversations that are had, like when I help somebody and I, or even if I just give them direction, like, Hey, I don't think you need to hire me actually. Why don't you just try this? You know, because I'm always like, I'm down to give you, like, I treat it like a consult myself. I'm like, Hey, this is what I'm doing. This is what I got this information. So like to help them build like their checklist for the future, like, cause Obviously, like I make the most of my whole uh, money wholesaling and JVing, you know, this is something that I do like on the side, but I have a huge passion for it. So I can't just let it die off. Like I love it too much. 
But like, you know, if I can help you be more sufficient in the future where you're only coming to me when you're like, stuff, I'm, I'm at a dead end. Like I've done everything you've told me to do, you know, then I know it's like, okay, this is going to be a challenging one, but this is going to be fun, you know? So yeah, I yeah, started yeah. that. I remember, I don't know who I talked to. I remember they said that exactly. They were like, Stephanie was like, go try these methods first. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, come back to me. And I'm thinking, that's so great. Like you're, yeah. you're so gracious with your time and you're so giving to people that are, are trying to work through these deals. And it becomes these situations, uh, these difficult ones that yeah. they really need to come in on and get you involved in and you know, it's, it's crazy when you can find them. What was this? Um, you, you were talking on the phone about it, the California conservative ship deal. Oh, what was that? I actually had to read my emails today about it to read. Like it was such a long one. It was a tough one, but like, it's kind of proves my relentlessness. Like, because, you know, again, I take this case on and I treat it like my own and I'm like, dude, I am just like, not going to give up. Like I cannot give up on this. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. I don't care how long it takes me. But um, so an attorney um, came, reached out to me, actually referred by you, Josh. Um, he, re he reached out to me and was like, hey, we have this deal. Um, you know, basically all we know is like we have this deal in Florida that we, we know that the, the owner was the grandmother. She had two sons. Um, we think that one of them is named Victor, but we're not sure. It starts with a V. Um, and then we know that this other guy, Vincent, um, he's been like kind of MIA for the last 30 years. We think he might've lived in California. We're not sure, but the granddaughter of, we think Victor, um, she's the, she owns 50% of this property and we're, we're in a contract with her. And then we don't know where this guy, uh, Vincent is, or even if he's alive, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh, that's such... and it was a very common last name. And I'm like, it was Williams. So I was like, oh my gosh, oh, that's so I, this is going to be a tough one. Right. So I'm like, Okay, so again, I'm going backwards in the tree to go forward. There wasn't a lot to work with on Ancestry because, again, common name. And so I'm like, okay. Um, but somehow I got his date of birth. I got Vincent's date of birth, and that's very important. So I was able to do just a skip trace with his name and a date of birth, and I got two hits in this whole state of – I think I did the state of California – I got two hits. So then I'm like, okay, I'm going to analyze these like a sniper. Like I got to figure this out. So I'm looking, so I don't, I don't know which one it is. So I'm looking and, um, the aunt of the granddaughter, but like on the maternal side, mm -hmm. she was handling, you know, all this stuff for her granddaughter. And so I'm like, I want to talk to her. So I talk. so Josh connects me to her and she tells me, she says, all I know is that we know he was in California and he's either in prison or in a mental facility with quote unquote, no way out. So that to me told me like, okay, this guy's gotta be, he either did something horrible or he's just like really needs a lot of care and help, right? So I'm looking at these last known addresses on one of the Vincent Williams, right? And I'm like, I Google it. I Google the address because I could tell it was commercial and I and it was like a mental facility, right? So I'm like, okay, this has to be him. Right. So I call the facility and, you know, again, like I know these people cannot share information, but I'm just going to ask, I'm just going to ask and get told no. And one guy is like, you know, I really shouldn't give you information. I'm like, I totally understand. I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble. I just want to know if this guy is here. And he's just like, call, call in the morning. He said, call me in the morning. And I'm like, okay. So I call in the morning. He's not there. Right. So someone else says, why don't you call and ask for the manager? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay. So I call back. And this guy says, um, I can't tell you if he's here or not. And I'm like, okay, well, can you just tell me a little bit more about the, the residents there? And he said, well, about 99% of them are conserved. So I said, oh, so they're under conservatorship. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, okay. So I'm thinking that's great. Like, that's great to know. Cause I'm like, usually they're like public guardians or, or conservators. So then I'm just like, and he said, a lot of them are referred to us by, you know, Santa Cruz County and Santa Clara County. So I knew I had two counties to look at. Ah. So I call Santa Clara County because I knew he had more ties to that side of the state. And sure enough, like, seriously, I, it was just because I was so determined to find something that um, they finally direct me to the person handling his case. And I was just like, oh my gosh, well, months of this like going back and forth and then we find out that he's deceased but they're still kind of handling some of his like medical affairs 
And um, so it actually worked out better for the investor that brought me in because now the granddaughter is like full owner of this of this deal, you know, but it took months to figure this out because they didn't even know like to what extent his care was, you know? Wow. That so. is, that is crazy. You know, Stephanie, what comes to my mind is while you're walking through that with us right now, I hear listening to clues yeah, and applying that. Yeah. So a lot of, I mean, she wasn't able to tell you really what, any details were except where referrals were coming from. Yeah. But that was just enough to lead you down to the next path. So yeah. just when you think it's not a, a, a valuable clue, you still need to write it down and Absolutely. maybe it applies. And yeah. I can see you doing that all the time. It really, it's funny because if you look at my family tree, like I do one big page for every family tree and I have notes on the side of it. And like, there's been a couple, there's been one case in particular where I'm like, who I literally ask, who is blah question mark? Cause I'm like, they had the same birthday. Like, you know, it's weird. And then I figure out like, Oh, this guy changed his name to this. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's just like, but it's like, it's a question in my head that I'm like starting to trail on, but I, it's just not coming together yet. But it's like, keep those questions at like at hand because like they will pop back up and you're like, Oh, Hey, I'm, I'm seeing that again. That makes sense. Especially with addresses. I do that a lot with addresses that I see like kind of cross-referencing different properties in the past they've owned. Right. I do that a lot. I write those addresses down. Yeah. I was even thinking in my head, like sometimes a lot of people have one married name and then they get yes. divorced and then their name completely changes again. Absolutely. Like not even related to that. And then mm -hmm. the first name's Mary, which is common, but the, you know, you don't know what the new yeah. remarried name is. And it's just going back and forth and listening to clues and trying to find yeah. these documents, which is uh, huge. I know I'm sure we have a lot of people too that do investing in Texas, uh, mm -hmm. not just Florida, but Texas. Shout out to the Texas investors out there. I'm sure <laughs> McLean Bobbitt's watching. I love it. Uh, what was this clearing title issue, Texas um, title insurance thing? Okay. So this one was kind of funny, but um, another investor in Texas, again, a lot of these came from REI SIFT, which um, I want to talk about a little bit in a second, but yes, yes. Um, so this guy who's now is like a really great friend of mine brings me this case and he's like, Hey, we have this really special one. Um, it's a land. It's kind of like a land deal in Texas. It's a bigger piece of land. Um, but the title, our escrow officer is saying that we need to basically get a trust, like a copy of a trust from the previous owner. So I'm like, well, how long ago are we talking? So I look at the transaction history, 2002. Okay. This is two years ago. I'm like, yeah, right. We're not going to be able to get a copy of that. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's probably shredded by now. So I'm like, okay. So I'm like, can you send me the title, like the, the prelim, right? The title commitment. So he sends it to me and I'm reading it. And it is like the weirdest thing I've ever seen in terms of like the ownership. It was like the trust, it had the trust name, but it named like seven people, like beneficiaries. And it was just really strange. I've never seen mm -hmm. anything like it. And so I'm like, okay, like one girl in particular had like a really special name to me. Like I hadn't seen that before. And so I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going to plug this in and I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can get a hold of this chick and see if she has a copy of the trust. I doubt she will, but we'll try. Right. So sure enough, you know, this is a Texas deal. She lives an hour and a half from me now in California. So when I call her, she, she we're on the phone for 20 minutes. She's telling me that like, oh my gosh, yeah, like that was a horrible time in my life. My great aunt basically swindled me out of this deal because I was in jail and she had me like, she forced me to sign these documents, all this stuff. And I'm like, okay. And so while she's talking to me, I'm like looking up the deed. I'm looking up the deed transfer of this, from the trust and to this other dude, right? Who's, who's from South Africa, from Kenya, the current owner who's now deceased. So I'm looking and I'm like looking at the deed and I see a stamp on it from Stuart title. So I'm like, well, okay, there's a stamp from Stuart title went through title insurance. So why are we needing a copy of the trust? So then I'm like, you know, I like thank her for her time. I'm like, Hey, if, if they need something, can I call you back? She's like, yeah. So then I call up Stuart title. I'm like, Hey, just curious. Can I get a copy of the title insurance policy on the, for this escrow? And they're like, yeah, we just need a signed letter from the previous owner. And I'm like, perfect. Cause I just talked to her. Right. right. So, I get her, I draft up a letter. I have her sign it, you know, via DocuSign. I get it over to them. They forward us the, the title insurance policy and it clears title. It was just like, I'm like, that's so strange. Why didn't um, the current escrow, you know, title company catch that? Because I, it was just like very faint. It was a very faint stamp. But like, again, that's why I pay attention to the deeds because like 
those little things, they matter. I mean, that we would not have been able to clear it because there's no trust anymore. You know what I mean? So unless they were to do some affidavit thing or something, but you know, 100%. it was just, yeah, it was really cool. I was like, well, that, that worked out. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And like so. you said, a lot of people don't know about these little clues, like first the deed, right? Yeah. And then some people are looking at the deed, but they don't realize that the preparer of the deed yeah. can be very important. It could be a law Absolutely. firm. It could be a, a person. So somebody prepared that deed. Somebody yeah. signed the deed. Somebody witnessed the deed. I mean, who are all these yeah. people? Who's the notary? Um, and and you're just thinking about all these things. And, and Stephanie, I don't know if you see this in other states. I know they have it in Florida. But mm -hmm. if people put that property in a trust, sometimes the estate planning lawyer, what they'll do is a certificate of trust or an abstract. Yeah. And those are documents that get recorded. So it's like another little rabbit hole yeah. lead you down. Maybe an abstract is like cliff notes. Yeah, totally. The trust, but it won't name beneficiaries because yeah. that would defeat the purpose of having the trust. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know? So like yeah. these little clues help. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, definitely witnesses and yeah, the attorneys that prepare these documents like – you know, oh, the trust documents are lost. What do we do? Well, how long ago was this trust created? I don't know, 10 years ago, something like that. And I'm like, well, let's look at the deed. Let's see who prepared it. Let's call the, the law firm. Let's see if they have a copy. I mean, like they usually will if it's more recent, like in the digital age, you know? So it's just, it's just like, think, think creatively, think outside the box. Like I always tell myself like, Steph, what will you do if you're, if you were looking for your sister? or your mother and you're, you're like, you're dying to meet them. Like at what length are you willing to go? And it's just like, that's, I have to, I don't have to remind myself per se, but it's like, if I, cause you can get very, your, your brain can get very tired. I mean, looking at your computer so intensely and like trying to right. think about all this stuff. Um, I think McLean gives himself like a 20 minute time limit. And then he's like, I got to take a break. Um, and sometimes I feel that way too. And like, sometimes I'll spend an hour plus on one and I'm like, oh my gosh, my brain hurts. Like it really does, you know, but it's like, I have to keep going. Like I'm onto something or maybe I'm not, but I'm like, I'll come back tomorrow. Like I don't give up. <laughs> so. Right. And, and with doing all this, like you definitely have a process and an efficient system to working through these things, right? Kind of like what I was talking about in the opening of having a checklist, things that make it efficient to be able to qualify the situation. You yeah. have your own checklist that you've put together. Talk mm -hmm. about that and, and the importance of having that. How does that relate to finding potential people? Yeah. So I think like from my experience, the very first step is to make sure that this person still owns the property. Cause a lot of time, like we're, we're combing through data and we're finding these prospects or these properties to go after, but maybe we pulled the list last year. Right. Um, so it's like, I've had people refer me properties and they're like, okay, here's five of them. And I, and I just start, I go right to the appraiser or whoever. Right. And I look up owner and I'm like, Hey, these sold like two years ago. And they're like, Oh, this was a virtual driving for dollar prospect or whatever list, you know? And I'm just like, okay, well, first step, make sure they own it first, you know, like very first step, make sure they own it. Um, but it's, it's, it's to like, give you a more well-rounded view of really what you're looking at. So it's like, yeah, you might've pulled it from a tax delinquent list and maybe, I don't know, code enforcement, but are they still tax delinquent? Cause people pay off their taxes all the time, or maybe they sold it. Maybe the family member paid it or whoever, right. They got a loan. So it's like, are they still tax delinquent? Because is there still distress going on? You know? Right. So I always make sure like, can we look up the code enforcement case? Can we look up the taxes? Can we see what's, is it still this picture that we have painted? Right. So I always want to look at those things first, even though it might take an extra 10 minutes, it's important to me. Um, and then I, you know, depending if the owner passed away or not, it kind of directs me to which route I'm going to take. Like, is it just a quick skip trace? Is it going to be more of like, I need to figure out who I need to contact next. Um, but it can get very easy to get off on tangents along the way. And then you're thinking, did I already check that? Because, you know, maybe this is your third one you've done today. So it's very easy to get fatigued and to not to get off track and to be like, where was I? <laughs> So right. just kind of going down the, the checklist to some extent, and then you can kind of run down the rabbit holes after step five, you know, but you did all the, you did the checklist up to that point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you got to go through your motions. You have to go through the steps to making sure that you have a system to it and yeah. you have to follow it, right? It's getting yeah. back to basics and that's how I look at it. It's always getting back to those basics and run from there. Um, yeah. 
before we get to the end and talk about REI SIFT and, and the and the final end, I just got to do our, our roll call starting all the way from the bottom. There's so many people watching you, Stephanie. Uh, Nate, Nate Hare's watching. Love it. Yogi. Haven't seen Yogi in so Yogi. long. Uh, Joe Rowing the Great. I love that he's watching. Teresa, as always. Uh, Steven's watching. Felipe's watching. Michael. Uh, Chris. Chris Aleman. I oh, love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Chris is doing great things in Florida. He's, he's crushing it. Uh, Mark Monroe. I love seeing you on here, Mark. D. Dockery. Always D. Uh, <laughs> Uncle Carl. McLean Bobbitt is watching. Oh, he's yeah. on. <laughs> Drop another comment. Right? Out. <laughs> <laughs> he's on. He, yeah. He wants to get more, uh, more free stuff uh, to uh, skip trace people. Uh, Eric, Eric Melton. Thank you, man. I love it. Thank you for being on Matt Rathburn. He said, I've been, I have been verified for year years and just learned I can search license plates. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. I mean, they come in handy when you don't expect it. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can imagine. Um, and Zach's on, uh, thanks man. Appreciate it. Dom Felix is on Dom. I love it. <laughs> really appreciate it. Hey Dom, you never know. You come across a deal. You can't find an heir. Now you know who to go to. <laughs> uh, Mara. Oh, that was another oh, crazy. Man. I can think of so many people I worked with on probates. I'm sure you've worked with too. I mean, it's, it's so crazy. Um, and she said, Oh my God, I just used one of your tips right now and went to the person's <laughs> Facebook comment and asked her to kindly look at her PM. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Look at that value given from <laughs> Stephanie Shepard on the show. Yeah, um, and I just got to say for everybody watching, I mean, one thing I want you to do is if you get something that's crazy, messy, you can't find anybody. You have to reach out to Stephanie Shepard. Anybody that works on a probate that can't find an heir knows that I'm like, you can't find them, get with <laughs> Stephanie. And we'll we'll make sure she drops uh, her phone number and any info. And uh, we got to do the shout out to the REI SIFT community. We love REI SIFT and what it means. So many amazing people that are a part of it. Uh, I know you had something to say. Yeah, I mean, I've been with REI SIFT for almost four years now, and um, Tyler Austin's the creator of it, and um, I just highly respect him. I, I just love him, honestly. Love um, him. But it's the community that I absolutely adore, um, and I've met some of my, like, bestest friends in there, um, and we all just, like, help each other. We have this, com like, commonality of, like, let's kick butt together, you know what I mean? And we all learn from each other and we all have our strengths and um, we help each other with our weaknesses. And I just like absolutely adore that community. So I just, and it's a great product. I mean, besides the community the, the product is, has been life changing for me in my business and for so many people that I know. Um, and if you don't know about it, check it out. They have a website and they, they have like a free trial. I mean, it's amazing if you're pulling your own data and you know, I pull my own data and it's, it's almost all like it's, almost purely vexation data. So it's like distress data. Um, it can really help you focus on what data to start calling first or texting or however you do your marketing, you know, it just helps you focus on the prospects you should first. And it helps you figure out like these really challenging deals where no one else is looking. So it's just, it's an amazing product. Oh, I, I have, I know so many investors that use REI SIF that have great success from it. We've had Tyler mm -hmm. on the show from season one. I we know. had him on uh, at, mm -hmm. after the break on season four and mm -hmm. love Tyler. And I love the investors in REI SIF. I can name so many people uh, that either I've done probates with that see the videos, um, REI SIF. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll leave the link up so everybody can see it there. Uh, but definitely check it out. And uh, Stephanie, this is, I mean, so much in one hour. I know. Um, I know. Like not it's, enough time. It's not enough. Yeah. But. I'm I'm ready for the Stephanie skip tracing course because everybody <laughs> wants to know about this kind of stuff. Uh, you have Dylan and Steven that just jumped oh, in Dylan. right there. Love that. I love it. Steph, as I do with all my guests on the Al Nicoletti show, I do a segment called final words, final thoughts. And for you, this could be anything you want to talk about that you haven't talked about yet, any concept you, you want to reinforce, any last words that you want to give, any advice. So as I do on my show, final words, final thoughts, Stephanie Shepard. I just want to empower everybody like that you can do this. You know, a lot of people think that they're not qualified to do this, but you really are. You just have to be willing to learn and commit to it. So I just want to empower you to 
go on that journey of like figuring this out because these are the deals that you're going to learn the most on that you're going to make the most on. Um, and you're now the most fun on honestly, um, because you can always join powers with other people in the, in your community. And it's just, you know, it's easy to feel like your voice can be lost when you're, you're not knowing what you should do, but I just want to empower you to do it. And, um, uh, don't be afraid to ask those questions because the worst you can be told is no. Um, but just have fun with it. And, you know, I'm here, I'm, I'm a big go-giver. I love to give back and I, I love doing what I do. I love sharing what I do. So if you ever get stuck, you know, there's me, there's a bunch of other people that can help you. And what's your phone number, Stephanie? <laughs> My cell phone number is 530-723-3256. You got to reach out to her. If you can't find these people missing heirs, mm-hmm. there's, there's, there's somebody somewhere and you really need that expert. And I love her. She does an amazing job for so many in the community and REI SIFT. Uh, so I just want to say, Stephanie, so great. We got to do this. I got to see you. I can't wait one day in person. We've talked about that a while. And uh, thank you for providing so much value to everybody in the real estate investing community. Thank you so much, Al, for having me. Of thank course. You I'll see you soon. <laughs> okay. Take care. My head's spinning from that whole episode. There's so much to uh, unpack. Uh, I mean, just barreling through the stories. I mean, there's so much to go through and you can see the knowledge that Stephanie has when it comes to these deals. I mean, messy deals, crazy deals. Um, I mean, how many, how many people have come across this kind of stuff in REI SIFT? I know you all are watching, you know, how many times are we dropping probate videos where we're talking about missing people or missing heirs or people, how many investors I work with personally that come across this stuff. Um, and, and this is, this is what we're here for. We're here to provide value back to you in the REI SIFT community, in the real estate community, and anywhere you are at, we want to bring on the best guests. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for participating, dropping comments. We love that kind of interaction. We want more of that. We bring on caliber guests like Stephanie that can bring that value back to you so you can level up your game in real estate. And if you want to learn more about the show, scan the QR code, the link tree will come up and you'll find out where you can find us. And, uh, we go live every Wednesday night at 9 PM Eastern. You don't want to miss it. We have amazing guests that constantly come up and next week you don't want to miss Jeff Weller. Jeff is coming on. He's talking about things with uh, Airbnbs and pad split. It's it's a wild episode. You don't want to miss it. And uh, I just want to say thank you. See everybody next Wednesday, 9 p.m. Eastern. I love you all. Take care. Have a great night.